Well, this was a wonderful beginning, also because I didn't have to make up a prayer, you know, at the beginning. We were already turning to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I, I admire you that you come to a, a talk with such a funny title, you know, that, what is this? And uh, um, so I hope you will be satisfied with the question. I did hear that it's not completely voluntary that you're here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it also might be that, you know, uh, I got to know the lovely sheep and the lambs running around the, uh, the library. So uh, maybe you'll be inspired by these words to love animals uh, a bit more. Okay, so, you know, why did I choose this theme or this topic? Well, so kind of my overall research aim is to revive the tradition of Catholic social thought. Okay? So what I mean with that is, so what is Catholic social thought? It's the systematic reflection on how best to order society toward the common good in the light of revelation. Okay? And there's a tradition in which we've been doing that. And as always, every tradition is under challenge, under pressure. And, um, you know, so I I'm trying to Work. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, on a major publication um, which I would like to entitle uh, Catholic Social Ethics. And there is no publication of this kind that um, focuses on the question of holiness, of the calling to holiness in society. Right? Um, and it's not easy because there, there was an attempt to do that, and it didn't go well. That was, the pur that was Puritanism. You know? uh, we, we, we Catholics, we've been more careful in that. Uh, but anyhow, I'm not going to go into that. And one, and the central principle of Catholic social thought is human dignity. Okay? So I've, I've worked extensively on human dignity. I've, I've written uh, several books on it and articles and so on. And so now I'm coming to a phase where I, I'm focusing on marginal questions or challenges. And one of these is this here. So there is an increasing movement to grant rivers, mountains, animals, plants, and so on, legal personhood. Okay. So um, it started in 2008. The first nation was Ecuador, here we go, 2008, that in its constitution granted Pachamama, Mother Earth, rights to exist and to be protected and so on. So we were talking of rights of nature. Okay? Bolivia followed in 2010. And in the US, too, there have been attempts to um, embed in and, and successful attempts by grassroots movements to embed rights of nature into local ordinances, even though none so far has succeeded in granting legal personhood or legal standing as such to um, a non-human entity. Okay? So the first nation that did do that was New Zealand. In 2014, New Zealand declared the Wanganui River its own legal personality, and it is an indivisible and living whole with all the corresponding rights, duties, and liabilities of a legal person, okay? And so other nations have joined, have followed this. So uh, India did declaring the Ganges and the Yamuna rivers legal persons, Colombia, the Atrato, Canada, the Magpie River, and there are more, so it's not, this is not a single or uh, an isolated phenomenon. It's like a slowly becoming an avalanche, okay? And it's arrived in Europe uh, 2022 for the first time in Europe and for the first time in the world, a nation declared a lagoon, El Mar Muerto in Andalusia, as a legal person without any indigenous or you know, a native nation's uh, roots, you know, without any roots in the myths and the 
um, religions of native peoples. Okay? So um, uh, how does that look with animals? Okay? So in the United States, animals are not persons. Right? But in 2021, in Ohio, of all places, uh, a court, sorry, nothing against Ohio, uh, had to decide as like a prerequisite for its decision, which I will be explaining soon, whether they could, uh, whether they should accept the Colombian law that granted hippopotami legal personhood. And so they said, who are we to judge a foreign law? We just have to accept a foreign law. So hippopotami are persons. Okay? In this case, as a preliminary question, but what was it about? It was whether the hippopotami had a, I, don't, I want to call it that way, had a right to receive contraceptives. So, so they said, <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, it sounds funny. But so, and then uh, this one, this guy here, this lady here, is called Happy. Okay, so this is not the picture of Happy. Happy is an elephant uh, in, I think, the Bronx Zoo, who's been there for 40 years. She's pretty unbearable, so she can't be with any other elephant. Um, and so in 2022, an animal rights group claimed habeas corpus rights for Happy and said, we have to liberate Happy because Happy is a person and she's being held against her will in this zoo, right? So the court said no, because in American law, uh, animals are not persons, you know? But in Connecticut, since 2016, there's a statute that allows human lawyers to represent cats and dogs at court. So if you have stray cats and dogs, if you feel so inclined, you can go and represent them. Okay, so um, what about plants? Well, uh, plants usually are subsumed under nature. Okay? Even though trees were the actual historical origin of this whole movement. Okay? Um, but it doesn't stop there. Okay? Uh, so uh, there are people who want to declare the moon a person. And it's literally the man in the moon. And you could say, who is, who is making these proposals? Well, very serious people. Okay? This is not, these are not silly proposals. This, is, this was published in the University of Chicago Law, Law Journal, one of, you know, very important university, leading university. So this is really serious. And, and you'll understand better why they're doing this when I come to the classical essay and article that in 1972 uh, got this whole thing going. Okay? Uh, so some people praise the idea of legal rights and legal personhood of nature as you know, as the legal revolution that would save the world. Well, I, I don't know, you know, I, uh, the savior of the world is Jesus Christ, and, and uh, I don't think that um, this, but anyhow, messianic enthusiasm, okay? And, and um, so what is troubling, okay, is a different kind of movement um, that considers humans actually as the cancer of creation that thinks that actually the world would be better without humans. And that, uh, you know, if humans were to disappear, wrote Paul Taylor, uh, one of, in his Environmental Ethics, a very influential book in 1975, you know, the world would just say good riddance. You know, it would be actually better for the world to be without humans. And uh, remember Peter Singer, who um, in his book Animal Liberation in 1974, I think, um, wrote that distinguishing between humans and non-human animals is equivalent and just as unjustifiable as to distinguish between blacks and whites uh, based on race. It, 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 and he calls it for, for, for lack of a better word, word I call this speciesism, speciesism, okay? So speciesism or speciesism is um, 
a very frequent word, and it's taken very seriously, and it's not easy to argue against that position, even though for me it is very easy, and it's a moral absurdity even to have to do so. But as Chesterton said, in 100 years, the only people who will be defending evidence are the Christians. You know? um, so, okay, so what, what is the origin of this? The origin of this is an article by Mr. Chris, Professor Christopher Stone. Um, hey, I would like to one day write an article like that, you know, not with that same content, but with that same impact. So this is an article that has been quoted tens of thousands of times. It's been re-edited. There have been special editions commemorating the anniversaries of the publication of this article, okay? So, and it, it has a funny title. It's, uh, you know, should trees have standing? You know, it's like, well, they, they, trees tend to stand. If they've fallen down, they're not trees anymore. But so in US American legal terminology, standing means the right to make a claim at court, okay? And so he was arguing for trees in a zone that was going to be uh, converted into a skiing resort. And so in uh, the, the, I think it was the, the Serra Club or they, uh, or the Sierra Club, I know. They uh, went to, up to the Supreme Court uh, based on the arguments of Professor Stone and they lost, okay? So the, the Supreme Court at that time uh, with, with one dissenting opinion against, so one dissenting opinion was in favor of this, uh, of the content of this article. But uh, in, so it was, um, yeah, rejected. However, so what, what is his argument? He says, I'm not saying such a silly thing as that no one must ever cut down a tree, okay? What I'm saying is that there is a difference um, so granting legal standing to inanimate objects like a river or a tree makes a difference in the legal operational sense. Okay? So the example he gives is imagine a legal order in which slavery is allowed. Okay? In such a legal order, the law has to make a decision who gets indemnified for harm if the slave is injured. The owner, because it is his property, or the slave, because he is injured as a human person. And the same is true for the fetus. You know, if, if a fetus is harmed in the mother's womb, who gets the money? the parents because their costs are increased or the born baby once, it's, once he or she is born. You know? So these are decisions which become inevitable in a legal system. So he says, if we have a river that is polluted, then you have owners along, in, in the legal system as it was, you have owners along the river and each one is harmed a little bit. But, only up, but they can individually only sue the originator of the pollution up to the amount of their own harm. So if my property has been damaged in the height of $10,000, I can get $10,000 and not more. But what if making the river whole again costs $10 million? Who can claim that? So uh, his argument is that giving rivers legal standing would enable environmental groups to speak out in the name of the river and, um, you know, and, and make it whole, okay? Uh, so since then, these things have been, been coming into legal law. You know, we've, uh, it's become more frequent that uh, environmental agencies can fine companies who pollute rivers, that th there are much stricter laws and so on. Uh, but it's interesting to observe that since 1972, when this article was published, there have been few substantial new arguments 
And it's been practically a fleshing out and unpacking of the arguments of Stone. Just one new argument that struck me is that people now come to realize that government agencies aren't always that effective because government agencies are under pressure of lobby groups and politicians want to be reelected and they need donations. And so, lo and behold, and to nobody's surprise, really, uh, it's much more effective to have grassroots movements and local interested people who defend their own environment. Okay? This is called associational standing, right? And that would make sense. If, if you, as an interested person, want to defend your own environment, you're going to be more interested and more behind it than a distant agency, okay? So, hey, we've been saying this, we being the Catholic social tradition, for centuries, we want subsidiarity, right? We, or federalism. We, we don't want centralized uh, power structures. Okay, okay. so, uh, and, and as I said, what is new is this deep ecology and these deep ecological arguments, and I, I don't give too much credence to, to this, but if you Google voluntary human extinction movement, uh, you will find there's an association that promotes voluntary human extinction, okay? And um, I, I, I don't really take it very seriously, honestly, but I do take seriously a Christian uh, thinkers who, out of a misguided Christian responsibility, say that we shouldn't have children, or married people shouldn't have children. I shouldn't have children, but married people shouldn't have children. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's have a look a, a little closer at what legal personhood means. Because, you know, you could say, well, hang on, isn't a business corporation a legal person? Isn't a nation state a legal person? A municipality? Isn't the ITI a legal person? Aren't universities legal persons since the Middle Ages? Corporaciones, right? Uh, what about churches? Churches are legal persons, so why not a river? Why not a mountain? Why not Pachamama, right? Uh, well, the difference is that all the examples I mentioned facilitate human agency, right? Uh, we create corporations, we declare legal entities as persons because we either want to incentivize human action or we want to protect clients who can sue larger pools of resources and become indemnified than just getting redress from an individual. Okay? Whereas last time I tried, I couldn't get any money out of the river that had flooded our house. Right? You, you know, I could say it's a legal person, but who am I going to sue, you know, sorry, or the tornado, uh, who, who's going to sue the wind, you know. So um, in our, in our um, modern Western political philosophy, we have tied together human dignity, personhood, and human rights in a tight knot, okay? And I call it a notional perichoresis or perichoresis, okay? You know the trinity, the perichoresis in the trinity, the mutual interpenetration of each person, right? And so in a certain way, in, in modernity, we have this mixing. You can, you can read it in Kant, in the Grundlegung der Met einer Metaphysik der Sitten. Uh, he explains this very closely. But you can also read it in Thomas Aquinas, but dispersed. It's, it's already there. And... Um, uh, so this, this is taken from Kant. Every human being is a person with dignity. Dignity means being an end in itself. This is taken from Christopher Enders in his book on human dignity in the German constitution. Human dignity is the right to have rights. And then this is paragraph 16 of my beloved ABGB, Allgemeines Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch, the Austrian Civil Code, from 1811 but it was actually first published in 1797, right? So we're in the middle of the Enlightenment, 
and, and it says, every human being has inherent rights which are already evident through reason and is therefore to be regarded as a person, right? Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all humans are born equal and in possession of natural rights to which belong the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so this is, this is, the, the, this is the world we live in, and it is influenced, deeply influenced by, by, by the Christian tradition, okay? I always thought that the concept of human dignity is actually something new, that it is something that came into our history through the Enlightenment, okay? That was my work hypothesis when I started research. And I, I had to completely change my position because I discovered that the concept of dignitas does not appear anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. The only term that does appear is image of God. And it's a hidden image. It's a himid, hidden phrase at Genesis 1, 26. You know, and and um, all of a sudden, after the event of Christ, the two first commentaries we have on Genesis, both in Latin and in Greek, Tertullian and Theophilus of Antioch, they link the concept of image of God, Akon II, with the Roman law concept of dignitas. But what they, and what they do with this is they upend the whole pyramid of social honor prevailing in antiquity. So in antiquity, the order was virtus meritum dignitas. You had to perform acts of prowess. You earned merit, and then you were granted dignity. Works of prowess, you had to have killed at least 5,000 enemies of Rome. Caesar, in one battle, his first battle against the Helvetians, killed 80,000. In all, one million in his Bello Gallico. Okay? Bello Gallico. And then he got meritum, kind of, you know, and then he got dignitas. And he says, I did everything for my dignitas. In Christianity, it's the other way around. Dignitas is given. You can be a slave or free, and a free man, a man or woman, Greek or barbarian, you know. We're all one in Christ. You have this dignity of a contiu. And then, therefore, you have to be virtuous and you will get the reward, okay? So that, that is the notion we have in Christianity. Whereas this, if, 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 uh, if you consider personhood something which is conceded by the law and by the Senate or by whatever, by society, all of a sudden you're back to the Roman model, okay? And, and um, uh, Maitland in his English introduction to the translation of Otto von Kierke's uh, corporations in the, in the Middle Ages, he says, concession theory, sorry, fiction theory leads to concession theory, okay? Uh, all of a sudden, my personhood too is nothing that is recognized, but is conceded, granted, and can be revoked. So this movement actually endangers us, right? Uh, um, so uh, here comes my general methodological approach. If I find something is wrong, I have to give a better answer because every wrong answer is an answer to a correct question. And I can't solve the question by ignoring it. I have to, from my tradition, try and formulate a better one. Okay, so here, I'm trying to live up to my own standards. Kenneth Goodpaster, one of the founders of business ethics at the University of Harvard, and then he moved to the University of St. Thomas, where I am now. Uh, he says, he, he wrote an article that was quite quoted and cited, where he addresses this question of, uh, of natural of rights of nature, okay? And he says, he makes four distinctions, right? He says, we have to distinguish between rights and moral consider considerability. 
rights is a much more narrow concept than moral considerability. It means being morally relevant, okay? not necessarily having rights, because having rights presupposes moral agency, whereas moral considerability can consist in moral agency, but it definitely gives you moral patience. You become the object of somebody else's duty. Okay? Then he says we have to distinguish between moral considerability and moral significance. Okay? Significance is the comparative judgment of moral weight. Okay? So moral considerability just says this is morally relevant, morally significant answers the question of whose claim has precedence in a conflict of claims. Then we have to distinguish between intelligibility and normative substance. Right? So what this means is that um, intelligibility analyzes the, the language in which moral judgments are formulated. Uh, normative substance decides the normative question in itself. Example, if you analyzed the legal language of the southern states before 1860, you would have the impression that African Americans were not persons in the legal sense, okay? According to intelligibility, not according to normative substance. According to normative substance, uh, they were, of course, persons, right? And the fourth distinction is between operative moral considerability and regulative moral considerability. Operative, as a moral considerability is operative when the thorough acknowledgement of X by A is psychologically possible, okay? So going by your faces, I have lost you, uh, but let's try and recoup, okay? So this is Ken, dear friend. So what does moral considerability of nature mean? It is a concern for a relatively substantive versus purely logical or intellig intelligible criterion of moral considerability versus moral significance of a regulative versus operative source, sort, okay? So um, it is substantive, but we don't know who has precedence and it is not really operative because I can't always live it but it is definitely regulative in my, in, in my thinking. And so being a living thing is both necessary and sufficient for moral considerability so understood, whatever may be the case for the moral rights that rational agents should acknowledge, okay? I think that is a very sensible uh, position, okay? And um, now let's turn to what does, what does theology have to say to this? Right? Um, because, you know, my impression is that ecocentrism or biocentrism or deep ecology, the problem is not that it says too much, it says too little. Theology says much more. Our revelation tells us much more. Okay? So these are two remarks that I want to make, preliminary theological, methodological remarks. Right? So be wary of attempts to reinterpret the tradition in the light of contemporary issues, but rather strive to understand contemporary issues in the light of the tradition, okay? So what I've seen in envir environmental ethics is that they say, well, we have to reinterpret our tradition in the light of the environment. And I said, mm, I'd rather judge the environmental movement in the light of the tradition, okay? That is what we call hermeneutics, right? The hermeneutical approach that the Second Vatican Council endorsed in Gaudium et Spes and called it a dialogue, okay? And then the Second Vatican Council proclaimed a new humanism in what has been termed the anthropological turn, focused on the question, who is man? Who is woman? Who is man, okay? Um, it is my impression that our culture has shifted to a social perspective from who is man which we have not been able to agree on. Okay? We've, we've given up. We have moved on to the question, how do we wish to live together, which we must agree on.
Okay? So we have to find a way to live together if we want to. Not. I mean, we could end up in a civil war, okay? but um, so far we don't want to do that. And, and, and so we, we, the, everywhere you go, you know, now it's like oh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and you know, how, how can we be inclusive? How can we um, be respectful? Um, how can I avoid harassment? How can I avoid microaggressions? All these things, okay? So this is all uh, a result of this social perspective which we have. We're not asking for the truth anymore. We're asking of what are the rules of, of peaceful coexistence, okay? So uh, what happened in theology? Well, uh, we talk of a greening of theology uh, since the 1980s, at least, and also the greening of Catholic social thought, okay? And uh, this, these three frames, um, I will explain them a little bit. Okay, stewardship ethic, uh, this is the traditional one. Uh, I think we've all heard that. Uh, dominion in Genesis 1.28 doesn't mean exploiting, it means being responsible for as a good steward. Okay? Um, its, act, its emphasis is on the individual. What can the individual do? Eco-justice goes a step beyond this and asks, what about the systems and the structures that make people act in an unjust way? And finally, creation spirituality um, says stewardship is not enough because we have to ask why is the steward in possession of that piece of land or that thing or that wealth? What is the original acquisition? And it's funny that the word steward is actually unique to English. Their attempts to translate it, but stewardship and steward is unique in English. And one of the earliest mentions of this uh, is in 1539, when Henry VIII confiscated the church properties, like an enormous amount of wealth, and declared himself the steward of it. Okay? And the kings, the stewards, are called st stewards because they were stewards, right? Seniscalcus. And um, so that kind of makes it a bit difficult for, for us to um, kind of reconcile with that term. Okay, here, let me give you an example of Benedict XVI, and Benedict XVI has such clear language. As a, as, a, as a teacher, I could just give my students, read Benedict XVI, try to learn it by heart, don't change a word, you know, uh, I don't need to explain it, just learn it, okay? <laughs> so um, there exists a certain reciprocity. As we care for creation, we realize that God, through creation, cares for us. On the other hand, a correct understanding of the relationship between man and the environment will not end by absolutizing nature or by considering it more important than the human person. If the church's magisterium express expresses grave misgivings about notions of the environment inspired by ecocentrism and biocentrism, it, because, it is because such notions eliminate the difference of identity and worth between the human person and other living things. In the name of a supposedly egalitarian vision of the dignity of all living creatures, such notions end up abolishing the distinctiveness and superior role of human beings, and therefore, he says, the role of a steward and administrator with responsibility over creation, okay? Well, Pope Francis, uh, always good for a surprise, in uh, After Laudato Si, said this, first it must be stated that a true right of the environment does exist for two reasons. First, because we human beings are part of the environment. We live in communion with it since the environment itself entails ethical limits which human activity must acknowledge and respect. Man, for all his remarkable gifts, which are signs of a uniqueness which transcends the spheres of physics and biology, is at the same time a part of these spheres. He possesses a body shaped by physical, chemical, and biological elements, and can only survive and develop if the ecological environment is favorable. Any harm done to the environment, therefore, is harm done to humanity. Okay? 
Second, because every creature, particularly a living creature, has an intrinsic value in its existence, its life, its beauty, and its interdependence with other creatures. We Christians, together with other monotheistic religions, believe that the universe is the fruit of a loving decision by the Creator, who permits man respectively to use creation for the good of his fellow men and for the glory of the Creator. He is not authorized to abuse it, much less to destroy it. In all religions, the environment is a fundamental good. Okay? So this, you know, we say the right of the environment does exist. So you could think, oh, so he's going for the rights of nature. And then you see, well, actually, no. He says every harm to an environment is a harm done to humanity. So it's actually a right, a human right, of us humans to a healthy environment. And the second is, well, it's, an in, it's intrinsic because of God. Its intrinsic worth comes from God. Okay? So actually, what we see is this development. It's not an either or or exclusive. It's actually all like a growing, expanding circle where each bigger circle contains the good sides of the smaller circle. And it's all in, in, in a theocentric vision. Okay? And you know, I, I, again and again, I get the impression with postmodernism or also with deep ecology and ecocentrism and so on, that all those are distorted reactions to a non-Christian, stunted or distorted version of human reason. Okay? And so, I know my time is running out, um, but you know, my, what can our Catholic tradition deliver? And there's a movement called Green Thomism. Uh, Christopher Thompson, Daniel Scheidt, Stephen Long, even, you know, surprising. And, um, and, this, and, and this, this notion of sacramental worldview and, and the cosmic liturgy, okay? Um, so let me just give you this quote from Christopher Thompson. He's a, a colleague at the um, School of Divinity at St. Paul Seminary. He said, in its secular mode, one can understand the increasing emergence of environmental awareness as the unthematic revolt of conscience among those descendants of the Enlightenment who intuit that something is deeply flawed in the habit of treating nature as a mere raw datum of purposeless, purposeless matter. Okay? It's the Baconian uh, reduction uh, and exclusion of, of God-given final causality. Okay? And it's, it's not, not a surprise that Benedict XVI uh, advocated simultaneously for a widening of our concept of reason and for the protection of the environment. And, um, and in this, he's, he's deeply Thomistic. You know, uh, Thomas says, cognitio naturalita precedit appetitum. Right? And, and uh, so that means the truth and the knowledge of the truth is receptivity. It comes before usefulness. And, um, and Thomas uh, rejects as omnino inconveniencia the position of our origin that the bodily world and the animals and nature was created to punish sinful souls and sinful spiritual beings. And he says, no, bonum est eam esse, the creatura eam esse. And so in a certain way for Thomas, Knowing things and, and respecting them in their intrinsic worth is a contemplative exigency because we reach God uh, through central knowledge. And, um, you know, and, and he, in, in a beautiful statement in the first book of, of commentary on the sentences, he says, uh, is, it, is an angel better than a rock, a stone? And he says, yes, absolutely speaking, yes. But it is better, a universe is better, where there is both an angel and a stone. And he says, God had to create this diversity of things uh, because uh, this is for the greater glory of God. Uh, being, the, the multiplicity of being reflects the glory of God in a greater way than, um, uh, than just the, the individual angel or the individual good, okay? 
So, you know, um, second point, don't want to get too carried away by this, um, is this sacri the idea of the sacramental uh, worldview, okay? So Aquinas says, the best in all caused things is the order of the universe in which its goodness consists. So the, the, the best in all caused things is the order of the universe in which its goodness consists. And the universal common good is God, and there's a hierarchy of beings. All subhuman beings are created propta hominem, for man, and we're allowed to use and kill animals with moderation, right? And we are cooperators in maintaining this hierarchy. And, um, you know, it's um, this concept of the cosmic liturgy, which Maximus Confessor uh, created. And, you know, I, I think this longing for personhood of nature, or this, this idea of creating persons out of nature, is a secret longing for the logos, uh, which is Jesus Christ. And there's a, there's a, a theologian, uh, I read it, I've been searching for this quotation, I found the article in which he's quoted, but in the end, I think this is Maximus Confessor, that's why I put this right down here. You know? It is not that man is a part of the cosmos, but that, that all parts of the cosmos are parts of man. Man is not a microcosm sided by a macrocosm, nor is he framed within a macrocosm, but he is the actual cosmos, as he gives complete unity and complete meaning to all the parts of creation. You know? Gregory of Nyssa um, used the Trinity for the, for an, for the social analogy. He, he, he condemns slavery because he says, we are created in the analogy of the Trinity. In the Trinity, there is no um, more or less, all are equal. In the same way, we are all equal, and we are bringing a rupture into human nature with slavery. And I think we can go even further. We could say that we are the persons of the cosmos, right? Yeah. We are the ones in which the, the cosmos, without becoming he he Hegelians, you know, Hegelians, the, in a certain way, the cosmos is, con is conscious, you know, and, and, and we, we as renewed in Christ, are the priests of creation. Uh, we are created uh, with this task to mediate between God and creation. Okay, so um, how do we do this in, in, in practice? Well, I think we do that by uh, contemplation at work. This is JP2, who loves the expression cosmic, cosmic liturgy. Okay. Um, there we go. This, this, I took this from Dan Thoma. He, he says, liturgy consists in these three steps, purgation, illumination, union, and he attributes that to plants. They purge the soil. Animals see light. Human beings can be united with God, and this corresponds to the, to the three times three choirs of angels. And when we are gathered in liturgy, uh, we are the tenth choir of angels. And so we pour the light of God onto the whole of creation. And this is a beautiful thought from Eric Peterson. And you, you see these uh, fountains. You know, this is the way I imagine the choirs of angels without envy and with infinite generosity. They just share and pour and draw the light of God out uh, and onto us. And then we, when we pray and when we are in liturgy individually or collectively, we pour it out onto the world, right? So we are the priests of creation, each one of us. So contemplation is, is not what we do when we run out of answers, but rather the very ground that births and sustains a vision of knowing and of social action and transformation, okay? I love that quotation. It's from a book by Anna Rollins, came out 2021. Um, so contemplation, we know from the catechism, the summit of prayer life, an attentive gaze, marked by simplicity and constancy. And uh, Thomas Merton wrote, contemplation at its highest intensity becomes a reservoir of spiritual vitality that pours itself out in the most telling social action. Okay. So uh, contemplation is, as John Paul II said, 
the contemplative gaze onto the world. You know, or I, I uh, worked on this and I thought, well, JP2 would define contemplation as, as looking at God. But no, for, for John Paul II, the great, contemplation is looking at the world with the eyes of God. Okay? And um, so contemplation is a universal calling. Uh, the Catechism says that. And there, there's like three saints that mark three, three, that means I should shut up, <laughs> three steps. Uh, Aquinas contemplata ali stradere, Ignatius of Loyola, in actione contemplativus, but he's referring to the religious and the priests. And then Saint Jose Maria, who says, be contemplatives in the middle of the world, in work. Okay? So, okay, My, uh, these are the last two slides. I, as, a, as, a, as an Austrian uh, legal scholar, I'm very proud of Austria because with a uh, surety or security of a somnambulant, uh, the Austrian legal order uh, did something which is perfectly aligned with the Christian tradition and doesn't fall into ecocentrism. Okay? Those are uh, a constitutional law outside of the code of constitution um, that commits the Republic of Austria to sustainability, animal welfare, comprehensive environmental protection, securing water and food supplies and research. Okay? Note, they're not granting nature rights. They're putting an obligation on public authorities to protect. So this is moral considerability, not rights. And then already in 1988, they said animals are not things. So there's an, a, a recognition of the intrinsic worth. And I'm also pretty proud of Switzerland, okay, that um, uh, since 1992 uh, protects human beings in their dignity against research and against reproductive um, techniques and also animals and beings, and they use würde de creature, okay? because this has been strongly criticized by liberals in the US as an illicit um, incorporation of m Christian moral ideas into a legal system. Okay? For the same reasons, I commend it. Okay? So, well, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm available for questions or criticisms or perplexities. Thank <laughs> you.